in Romans chapter 7. Follow along with me, beginning in verse 1. Romans 7, verse 1, it says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus beginning in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Verse 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Verse 33, Nevertheless, each individual among you must also love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must must see to it that she respects her husband. So here we see uh, the, the correlation. Obviously, you can see the parallels running with that. But at, back in chapter 7, as we look at this and we start looking at these verses individually, remember that gospel, the, the, the book of Romans is, is all about the gospel, the good news. Remember back in chapter 1, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And there was a reason that he wasn't ashamed. He said, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It produces a total transformation in the life of a believer. There's, there's new relationships that, that take place. We as Christians, as born-again believers, have a new relationship with God. If you'll remember, we spent many weeks talking about that as we began our study in Romans. The new relationship that we have with God. We used to be enemies of God. Now we are children of God. We used to be unrighteous sinners. Now we are justified saints. Again, back in chapter 3, it tells us very plainly that we have all sinned and fall short of the, glorious, the glories of God. We are rebellious enemies of God in our nature. But God, praise God, praise God for the blood of Jesus, because it tells us chapter 5 that we have been justified by faith because of the blood of Jesus that has been shed for us. Chapter 5. If you'll remember when we were there a few weeks ago, verses 9 and 10, it says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Justified by the blood of Jesus. But it goes beyond that. We have a new relationship with God, yes, but we also have a new relationship to sin. We've been talking about that for the last several weeks, from the middle of chapter 5 all the way through chapter 6. 
that used the sin used to be master over us. Now we are dead to sin. No longer master over us. Back in the beginning of chapter 3, again, we talked about the fact that we have been baptized into Christ Jesus, not water baptism. Water baptism signifies or is symbolic of the baptism that takes place in us as believers when we are united with Christ Jesus, united in his death, burial, and resurrection. Resurrection to a new life, and we are called as Christians to now walk in this new life the end of chapter 6, as we looked at again last week and the, the, the week before, we are to consider ourselves, the fact that that took place, we are to now consider that, put that to our own spiritual account, consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, not allowing sin to reign in our lives. We have a new master. It's no longer sin. The master of our life now is the risen Lord Jesus, the cross of Jesus. He took us up in himself to the cross, and our old self was crucified with him. And we were introduced to this last week. In verse 14, it says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now we're going to see today that we have a new relationship with the law. We are no longer, as Christians, we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. Now, Last week, we had to spend the time with that question that was raised up right away in verse 15 of chapter 6. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law? Paul had to take care of that ridiculous question. Why, why would we do that when we have been freed from that? Why in the world would we jump right back into that slavery? Now, as we look now in chapter 7, we are going to deal with this third relationship change in the life of a believer in the life of you and I as born-again believers. And this part of Romans, the book, the book of Romans, in chapter 7 here, guys, this is essential to our sanctification. This is essential for us to understand how it is that we are to walk this Christian life out. There is no chapter break. I've mentioned that often. I, it, 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 it makes me laugh sometimes as to why they put in chapter breaks where they did. Because there is no chapter break. Nothing belongs in here. There is no pause between the end of chapter 6 and into chapter 7. So we look at this, beginning in verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who are under the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. He gives a general principle there, but then he gives this illustration. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall, not, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that if she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. It's speaking here again of this general principle. It's this law that has rule over dominion or dominion over someone as long as that person is is alive. Now, again, when we're just talking about that here, and, and that makes sense, right? That nobody is going to argue that. It doesn't, it's not like we're having to wrestle through that and say, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm struggling with that concept. No, it makes perfect sense. One thing we do have to understand, though, is Paul is not referring to the Mosaic law when he's speaking of law there. He's not talking about moral law. He's talking about like law, the, the, the law of the land, and he's using marriage as an example with it. But just to draw that out, the law of the land. It makes sense, right? If somebody is guilty of a crime, they're tried and they're convicted and they are sentenced to 25 years in prison, and on their way out of the courtroom, they drop dead of a heart attack, they don't take the corpse to prison. They don't put the, the corpse in the jail cell for 25 years and then 25 years then take it out and throw it, throw it. No. As soon as that person is dead, the law has no more jurisdiction over them. Now, Paul uses a less morbid example. He uses the, the example here of marriage. And as we kind of begin to dive in and look at this, first of all, we need to understand, again, Paul is speaking of God's design for marriage. And it was universally accepted then, some of the things that we read in Ephesians there, that the wife is under the authority of the husband. And this goes back all the way to the beginning. This wasn't something that, that was just recent in, in, the, in the time that Paul was writing Romans. So this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. God said, your desire, speaking to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That is, that is the, the design that God has for marriage. 
Now, that becomes a difficult thing when people are discussing that because of, of unfortunately, the way husbands have taken that a lot. Several, a lot of husbands have, have taken that as this ruling, domineering type of thing, but that's not God's design behind it. Again, I purposely read all of the verses that are dealing with that in Ephesians because we as husbands are called to love our wives as Christ loves the church. And Christina and I have had the opportunity several times over the years to, to speak to marriage groups and different things like that. And one of the things that, that she says often when she's going through that is, ladies, if your husband, or speaking to us, us guys, actually, she says to us as husbands, she says, guys, if you will treat your wives outlined as my husband just explained, and I go through what it means to love your wife as Christ loved the church. She says, guys, get this, understand this. If you treat your wives like that, they're going to have, we are going to have no problem submitting to you. We are going to have no problem counting under your authority. And if you think of that and you look at that, is it in that example? It's the same way, again, as Christ loves us. That's why it's so easy to submit to him, because we understand his love for us. The fact that he gave his own life for us. Wives, under the authority of their husband. And, by nature, we understand that all mankind is under the authority of the law. And we, we talked about that back in chapter 2 of Romans. That, that even though those that didn't get the law written and handed to them, the law was written on their hearts. So this is, this is, this is the way God's designed, and it's, and, it's, and it's all built in. God's design for this relationship, husband and wife, of, of love and, and husbands loving their wives and wives submitting to their husbands is a binding relationship. It is designed to be a permanently, permanently bound relationship. Divorce was given as a concession. That was never God's design, ever, ever, for marriage. The principle is, is there. It's, it's very clear that marriage is broken only by death. Now, many people say it. Unfortunately, very few mean it when they get married till death do us part. That's, that's part of the marriage vows, right? And the principle here that Paul is underscoring and, and laying out is that the death of the husband frees the wife to marry another. Now, this could easily turn into an extended marriage, uh, sermon on marriage, <laughs> So I have to guard against that because that's not Paul's point either. <laughs> he he has a very personal or a very particular application that he's driving at, and it's not it's not about marriage and divorce. It's about the law and death. That's that's the point that Paul is driving at the the spiritual application that we are to take away from this. And notice again, he uses that term, the terms that are in here in verse four. Therefore, therefore, my brethren. He's speaking to Christians, obviously. He uses that term, brethren, Christians. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. We are all, again, accountable to God and his holy standard. Back in chapter 3, just for by way of reminder, chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says... It speaks to those who are under the law. And again, as we just covered, that is every human being by nature. We are all under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all of the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, Paul underscores this, and we did very, very heavily when we went through this. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. No flesh justified in God's sight, by the works of the law. Now, the reason I underscore that is because sanctification by the law is just as impossible. It's not, it's not that it's really, really difficult to be justified by the law. Remember, we talked about that. It is impossible for any of us to be justified, to be righteous before God by obeying the law. Impossible. Guys, it is just as impossible to be sanctified by the law. It is just as impossible to live out a life that pleases God as a Christian under the law. It is just as impossible. And Paul puts it this way when he's writing to the church in Galatia. He says in chapter 3, verse 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, 
Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Isn't it funny that that's kind of our natural tendency, though, right? That we want to have credit. We want to be able to say, well, look what I did, and all of this kind of stuff. And so we're going to try to please God with all of these different things. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, <laughs> why, why are you even trying to do that? It is impossible. Something radical had to happen to us as Christians. And praise God, it did. Notice again, the way it is written in verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Something radical had to happen to us, and it did. He made us die to the law. Being a Christian involves something very radical. It involves death. And it involves death and, and then new life, being born again, a new creation, regeneration. It involves an entirely new relationship, again, to God, to sin, and to the law. It involves a an entirely new purpose that is laid out here in, the, in verses 4, 5, and 6, to bear fruit to God, no longer bearing fruit to death, but to bear fruit for God. And over and over we talk about this, it involves entirely new power, new strength, new ability, the Holy Spirit in us. And he highlights that through the body of Christ, through the body of Christ. As we kind of kick off the, the Christmas season, Christmas, what we do during Christmas is we remember the incarnation of God. Jesus taking on human flesh, becoming, becoming one of us, being born as a baby, that unbelievable miracle that we think of. The fact that he would humble himself to that point. God becoming a man. And again, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul writes this in verse 4, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Not only born as one of us, but born as we are under the law. So that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. To take us from being under the law, he had to be born under the law himself. So what, what, what happens from that point? Well, Jesus himself tells us. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Fulfilled. See, the, the law isn't the problem, and we're going to get that into that more as we get into next week and, and continuing on through chapter 7. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with that. The law is not the problem. <laughs> Basically, I, I love how, how gentle he can be sometimes. He should, he should have just said, you're the problem. <laughs> the law isn't the problem. You are. So that's why I'm here. I am here to fulfill the law. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures, all that was, was laid out. 613 commandments, by the way, 248 of them positive, 365 of them negative, 240, 248 say do this, 365 say don't do that, and you can only imagine, and again, it's been played out throughout history, what a playground that is for the legalistic mind, <laughs> all of these do's and don'ts, and how do we twist this, and what do we do with all of that, the Sabbath laws that were given, and then all of the Sabbath laws that were man-made. Jesus opposed that legalistic religious system. And we see that throughout the Gospels. But he did not come to abolish, destroy, replace, in any way contradict the law that was given. Because the law is perfect. Matter of fact, as we study through the Gospels and what Jesus tells us and how he lays it out there, he sums it all up. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commandments, hang all of the rest, everything else. He said, I didn't come to do away with any of it, but to fulfill it. Fulfill all the law and the prophets. In Luke chapter 24, after Jesus rose from the dead, he's on the road to Emmaus, and he comes alongside a couple of those that had been following him. And, they, you know, the stories, it's played out there, and he's talking to them. They don't know it's Jesus. As they're walking alongside of him, they just think he's some stranger. And, 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 and Jesus is, is just kind of playing along with that whole thing. And, hey, what's going on? And they're like, haven't you heard? No, heard what? 
But what happened back then? Well, no, what's going on? Well, the, the Messiah, and they're talking about Jesus and how he was crucified and, and buried, and, and Jesus just goes along with them. But eventually, he reveals himself to them as to who he is. And it tells us that he explains to them, start beginning, beginning with Moses, beginning back at the beginning, all of the, the law, the prophets, all of those things as to how it pointed to him. Earlier on in his ministry, as he as he is as he's dealing with the Pharisees and the and the Sadducees as they're coming against him, he says, "You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but what you fail to realize is they point to me. They are all talking about me." You see, Jesus came to fulfill the law, to accomplish the law. Now, the law is broken up into a few different sections. There's the the, the sacrificial or the ceremonial law. We need to understand that the, the, Jesus fulfilled that because all of it pointed to him. All of the sacrificial system, all of the feasts, all of those things, all pointed to him coming, him suffering, him dying, him rising again to pay the penalty for our sin. It all pointed to him. Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes this, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These things are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. On that side of the cross, they could only see the shadow. And so that's what, the, what God had laid out for them, all of those things that pointed to him. But now on this side of the cross, we no longer follow all of those things. Because the substance is Christ. He has fulfilled it. And now we look back to him. Now we are, now we worship him. We're going to celebrate communion here at the end, end of the service today. That's what we do. We look back to the fulfillment of all of those things. Not that we don't recognize them here and there. One of the one of the things that if you have never been to a Seder dinner, I encourage you to do that. It takes the Passover, and it goes through step by step all the way through, and it shows how Jesus fulfilled all of these things, all of these things that, that the Jewish people are still blinded to, to as to understanding of how Jesus fulfilled it. But it's so clear when you see it from, from the lens that the Holy Spirit opens up our hearts to. It's, it's an amazing thing. All of that thing. So I, those types of things, if he fulfills that part of the law by pointing to him. But when it comes to the moral law, again, that has not been done away with. Jesus didn't come to, to sweep that away. No, he followed it perfectly. The Bible tells us that he is just like us in every way except without sin. Perfectly following the moral law that was laid out. And he satisfied the law completely because then he took your sin and my sin upon himself and paid the debt that you and I owe because we don't keep the law. He came to fulfill it. He came to reveal it to us. Reveal it to us completely. That it's not again about a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's about love. It is about loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And about loving our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus laid it all out. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, is that a new command? No. It certainly wasn't a new command in concept. Jesus just defined it for us so perfectly. This is what, this is, he says, he says, here's God's heart in all of it. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts to keep you under his thumb. It's because he loves you, and in response, you love him, and you love one another. And when we do that, Jesus said, you fulfill it all. Jesus, Jesus didn't come to leave us good teaching and leave us a perfect example to follow. And can we all just say praise God for that? Because that would make it worse. <laughs> that would make it worse. If, if he came and he said, okay, here's what you do, and then he modeled it all out for us, and he said, good luck to you, follow that. That would make it worse. That would make it worse. Hey, speaking with Ryan earlier, working working in golf. I, I love I love golf. I used to play golf a lot. 
That would be like giving hand to somebody having a hand at Tiger Woods handing me a golf magazine and said, "Here, read this." And then him taking about twenty five swings and saying, "This is how you do it. This is how you do it." Handing me his bag and walking away. And I would feel worse off than before I started because there's no way I could do that. But see, that's not what the fulfillment of the law is in that. You see, when we go back to our text here, notice this. This is so important. Verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who has raised from the dead. Notice, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So that there is a reason. He didn't come to teach us and give us an example and leave. Guys, he came to live the perfect life, die in our place, rise again. And as we talked about the whole thing, that he took us up in himself. He took our old self. He took our old Adamic nature. He took us up in him to the cross so that when he, we, he died, we died. And when he rose, we rose. The risen king. We are the bride of Christ to the risen king. And here it comes. In order that we might bear fruit to God. That's the order. That's the, that's the outcome. In order that, I, I, those, I, I highlight those things. That's so important. Whenever you see so that, circle it in your Bible. Whenever you see in order that, circle it. Because here's the purpose. Here, it, here it's laid out for us. Guys, we cannot bring forth fruit to God under the law. We, we can't. No matter how hard we try, we can't. We can only bring forth fruit to God joined to God. And isn't that what Jesus tells us in John chapter 15? John 15, beginning in verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can only bear a little fruit. Anybody paying attention? All right. I do see a bunch of shaking heads. Good, good. You're paying attention. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't bear any good fruit fruit. The only fruit we can bear apart from him is rotten, awful, stinking fruit. That's it. Good for nothing. Good for nothing. He said, if anybody does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this. That you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. That proves, that shows that we belong to him. That shows that we are born again. That shows that we are in Christ Jesus when we bear fruit. Jesus said, that's, that's the process. That's how it works. You love me. You abide in me. And I in you. My word abiding in you. And fruit is going to happen. And it's going to show that you belong to me. Again, back to the illustration that, that Paul gives. But we see so many times throughout throughout the, the word too. I mean, it's not like, it's not just here in Romans 7 and in Ephesians chapter 5, but this idea, this, this picture of, of a wedding, of us as the church being the bride of Christ. It's laid out for us in, in Revelation chapter 19. John says this, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Interesting. How do we prepare ourselves for the wedding? How, the wedding dress? I mean, having, having a daughter now who is getting married in January, I know all about the dress. Especially how much it costs. <laughs> but the whole process involved in that. I am... I. For me, it is totally foreign. I I need something. I, I can take care of myself really quick. I don't I don't need several fittings. I don't need you know I don't even really care if it's baggy or whatever. It's just it just just gotta clothe me. That's it. Man, I tell you what, this wedding dress thing is wow. 
off the charts for me. And I just kind of, as she's on and on and on telling me, yes, dear. Oh, yes, dear. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Wonderful. And she's just on and on describing the whole thing. And again, that's the bride. She's caught up in so much in love. Guys, as the bride of Christ, the same thing for us. Should be passionate about what it is that we are going to be wearing on that day. And it tells us, it refers to this as the, the, our, our, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I don't know about you, but it doesn't take me long to think about that for a moment. Because what does the Bible say about my best efforts? My best things that I can produce. What does it tell us in the Bible about that? It says that they're filthy rags. I don't want to wear filthy rags. Praise God that we're not done. Because the Bible says this, that he picks the garments out. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. You see, he prepares the garments. And he said, here, just do this in the power that I give you. And you walk this out no longer again under the law. That just produces the filthy rags that we have. But in Christ Jesus, under grace, here's what I have for you. And in the power that I give you, you walk this out. And in, so that, in doing that, you're pleasing me. And you're bearing fruit. And that is the, the, the fine linen that it tells us that we, that we get to wear on that marriage feast day. In in chapter in verses five and six, and we're going to use this more next week to kind of tie into the next section, but it it kind of really ties together with what we're talking about. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members of, of our body to bear fruit for death. Again, filthy rags. Verse six though, but now. We have been released from the law. We are no longer under the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So that, again, there's a reason why all of this. And we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not the oldness of the letter. Again, Jesus, remember, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. He empowers us to fulfill the law that we could never do under the law. It was impossible before. We talked about this back in, in chapter 6, in verse 4. So too we walk in the newness of life. We can do that now because there's a different relationship that we have with sin. And here now, we can serve in the newness of the Spirit because of this different relationship that we have. But it does not mean, it does not mean that any part of the law has been released or, or loosened in any way or changed in any regard. We've heard it, right? I hope that you've never used it as an excuse, but, you know, times are different now. Things are different than they used to be. So, it doesn't matter. God's law doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just because the culture around us is, seems to be getting more and more depraved all of the time does not lower God's standard for us as Christians. Not, not one jot or tittle as it's used, the smallest letter or stroke. Not one thing removed. Do you realize how important punctuation is? Yeah, any, any English majors? No, me neither. But I know how important punctuation is. One example, how, how powerful a comma is. There was a, a, a wife who was out shopping, and she was a respectful husband's wife submitting to her husband. She saw this. She was out at the mall, and she saw this this purse that she had been just, just, just oh, all of a sudden, so this is exactly what I want for Christmas. And so she texted her husband, and she, she said, this is what I want for Christmas. I'll get it now, and I'll, I'll, you know, this whole thing, and you can get it for me, da 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 and it's only $500. Can I get it? And he looked at that, he goes, are you kidding me? $500 for a purse? No way. So he texts back these words. No, comma, 
price too high. But he didn't put the comma in. So now what does the deck say? No price too high. <laughs> How important is a comma? Uh, my point is, not one comma is added. Not one comma is deleted. Nothing is changed in the law. What is changed is the way. Not the what. The way, the how, has changed, not the what. Now, instead of the, the oldness of, of the letter, now we serve in the newness of the Spirit. Same law, but we are able to do it now because we are under grace, by the power of the Spirit in us. Not legalistic adherence, but the byproduct. Of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Again, it's a byproduct of the love that we have for him that is response to the love that he has for us. And isn't love a better motivator anyway? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but growing up as a, as a child, I there were things that in obedience to my parents, as they would tell me things, I did gladly because I loved them. Much more so than when it came down and it was this, you know, authoritarian thing. And, you know, that old, you've probably heard that, that story about the little kid who finally, you know, his, his parents kept on saying, sit down right now. And he wouldn't sit down. Sit down right now. And then finally he sat down. He goes, I just want to let you know I'm standing up in my mind. You know, that whole idea that, again, it's, it's because it, this response, it's, it's the heart's not there. Isn't love such a better motivator? Again, guys, this, this whole section, as we continue to go through this, it's all about sanctification. Walking out this Christian life. It's all about truth. And Jesus said, your word is truth, Lord. Sanctify them, Father, with your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. We are joined together with Christ. We are united with him, baptized, these different words that are being used. And now here we see this, this term, this, this illustration, we are married to him. And Paul has covered that. And we looked at that as one of the reasons why we read through Ephesians 5 too, because again, that whole, the two shall become one flesh. We talk about that in the marriage vows and in the, in the marriage union between a husband and a wife. But Paul said, here's the mystery. That this is speaking of Christ us as the church becoming one see what happened to him happened to us and him fulfilling the law allows us to fulfill that and we're going to get to it but turn ahead right now to Romans chapter 8 this is exactly what Paul says that now because we are in him we are able to fulfill the law with him in, through through us. Notice here it says in, in Romans 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, and again, we'll get into that more next week, it's not the law's fault, it's ours, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, and here's that, so that, verse 4, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And there it is. Now, in Christ Jesus, Spirit-filled, born-again believers, we are now able to fulfill the law. Pleasing God. Bearing fruit. God tells us as his people, in his words, be holy as I am holy, he says. Guys, that is not only a command, it's an invitation for us to be holy. Again, in Him, by His power, through the Spirit. No longer under the law, but under grace. And as we tie this up and move towards celebrating communion together, again, that whole idea, no longer under the law, but under grace, that can, can stir up a couple of things, right? And, and we, we talked, we dealt with one of them last week. Oh, so we can just throw away the law and we just live however we want. And there is a, a lot of people that live their lives that way. Say, hey, I got my get out of hell free card. I can live however I want. I can do whatever I want. And again, 
revealing right there in, in their hearts and in their actions that, that they, they don't belong to Christ. And we're going to get, it again, more into that into chapter 8. But can I, can I say and speak to whoever's here that in your heart, and you probably all, we've all been there at different times, but maybe you're there even today, that, that as a born-again believer, you're struggling in it. And, and you can say in that, that voice that comes that says, well, if you're dealing with that and you're struggling there, or you're dealing with that, you're, you're not, you can't even be a Christian because you've just been hearing all of this and you should be da 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 no, you see, the great part about that is chapter 8, verse 1, is there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. We're here to confess our sin. The Bible tells us that when we do that, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are to, we are to walk holy. We are to follow this. And, and again, under, under grace, because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. His grace is sufficient. We we come to communion. And if you're struggling in an area, there's no doubt you probably say, well, I'm not worthy to, to celebrate this. Guys, that's why we do it. Because none of us are worthy. If it was all waiting around for us to be worthy in and of ourselves to do this, what we've just discussed means nothing. It's not our worth. It's his worth. And it's our worth to him the point that's why he came that's why he lived the life he did that's why he died the death he did he rose again to show that that death that he laid out for us that payment that he laid out to pay for our sin debt paid in full and that's why we celebrate as we do we reflect we celebrate this is a celebration Yes, we look back to the cross. We look back to everything that Jesus did to make all of this possible, our justification, to stand before him blameless, sinless, our sanctification, to where we are becoming more and more like Jesus, from glory to glory, more and more like him. All of that possible because of the cross as we look back and we remember all that he did for us. But we also look forward, as we read, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That day that is coming when we will all be in his presence. Jesus said, as he was with his disciples, he said, I will not take of this cup again until I enjoy it with you in paradise. That day that is coming. So, yes, we look back, but we also look forward. Again, <laughs> the, the, that marriage feast... I, I, I love food, by the way. I just, I just I love food, all kinds of food. And there is a part of that whole process that my, my daughter, again, going through all of that, the preparation and the food and all of that stuff for that day. But can I tell you, she doesn't care about the food. All she cares about that day is Mary and Colin. None of us. If, 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 if none of us, none of the family, none of the friends showed up, it wouldn't matter as long as he did. And, and that's what we look forward to. I can't wait to see what's on the menu that day. But guys, can I tell you? It doesn't matter. Because he's going to be there. My king is going to be there. That's all that matters. And that's what we look forward to. We look back to it. We look back to the cross. Because without that, none of this, none of this matters. But we look forward to that day. And we will be with him in, in that place and be with him forever, forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we come to this place and we are just in awe of you. Right? I, I think I can speak for all of us when we just, when we pause and we think about this for a second. God, we are so unworthy of your love. We are so unworthy of your sacrifice. What you gave in exchange for us. Lord, I thank you that by your spirit, we don't spend much time there because we just get caught up in the fact that because of your love, you did it all. Whether we feel we are worthy of it or not, Lord, our worth is based on what you were willing to pay for us. Lord, as we prepare now to, to celebrate communion, Lord. I, I pray that each one of us would just come to that place of just being in awe and worship of who you are and what you did. 
It would help us to understand that this walk of sanctification is not about a list of things that we have to do. Lord, if we just understand that we are no longer under the law, but that we are under grace and that we are filled with your spirit and that we are abiding in you, if we just grab a hold of that truth and live in that truth, Lord, obedience happens. Fruit happens. Pleasing our Father happens. And we owe it again all to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pass out the elements as we sing one last song together. Please hold on to them until we're done and we'll celebrate uh, communion together.